Presidential hopeful Trump rival and governor of Florida Ron DeSantis signed a bill earlier this week aimed at lowering drug costs for Floridians. The bill places restrictions on pharmacy benefit managers who act as the middlemen in the healthcare system who he claims have too much leverage in the market. Signing this bill, one among many landmark reforms DeSantis claims to be delivering for his state, and this comes at a time when there is intense speculation over his participation on the presidential race. Here's what he told the media outlets. And we've tried to do a whole host of things in Florida since I've been here to increase transparency in this whole system. So, for example, we have the price transparency where you can go online and look to see how much these procedures cost. We now have some health insurers for our state employees uh, they can do what's called shared savings. So if you pick a procedure that's cheaper at one place than the other, the, the savings gets passed on to you as a, as a, with your premiums going down. Uh, and we've been able to save people millions and millions of dollars in our state system. Uh, so we're happy about doing that transparency. We're also, we're the first state in the nation uh, to utilize a 2003 law uh, federally to let us buy drugs from Canada, which are a lot cheaper there. It was approved initially by the Trump administration. It's been held up by the Biden administration and the FDA because they say they're not sure it's safe to purchase drugs from Canada. Um, meanwhile, they'll approve a jab for a six-year-old baby with an MNRA COVID shot with almost no data for to support that. They don't care about the safety there, but somehow they're so concerned that if we just purchase drugs from a different market, that that's going to be a major safety concern in, in the United States. And of course, that's not true. They're just running interference for the pharmaceutical companies, because obviously, if we have to buy it here, it's way more expensive. It's the same drug just going across the border. So we're trying to access foreign markets uh, to do that. And um, they're still holding it up many, many years later, even though the Biden, Biden himself said that he wanted this, this to go forward. Uh, we've also, so in January, we said, what more can we do with drugs? So we hope we got the Canadian, and we're still fighting for that. We're in court on stuff, and, and so stay tuned. But we said, you know, one of the things that we see is when you go to, like, your pharmacy, you know, it's not like the drug's just there, you buy it. There's middlemen that are involved in providing this and charging for it. They're called pharmacy benefit managers, and it's a very opaque part of this process but they make huge, huge amounts of money and really help drive the cost of prescription drugs higher and higher. And right now, you have about three of these PBMs that control 80% of the prescription drug market. And what, who this really, it hurts, of course, consumers. It also hurts neighborhood pharmacies because they have practices that make it more difficult for these folks to stay in business. And you're going to hear that, about that from some of our speakers uh, today. So we see the prices going up. There's a variety of reasons for that. PBMs are one part of it. Uh, there's a lot of money being made, not a lot of value being returned to consumers and making it more difficult for our small businesses uh, to operate. So today we'll be signing the Prescription Drug Reform Act and it is going to reform these problematic practices that have been used by PBMs. So some of the things they do, so one thing they do is called spread pricing. And what they do is uh, when, when they charge health plans and payers, they will charge them more for a prescription drug than what they actually reimburse to the pharmacy. And then they keep the difference. Another thing they do is, and, and then and so be with that, in some claims, the total cost of the drug is actually less than the patient's copayment for the drug. And then the PBM will claw back the difference of that. Uh, and so that's not good for the pharmacies, of course, not good for the consumers either. So these are not practices that really benefit anybody. They're not really adding value to anything. It's just somebody's in the middle of this, and it's basically an arbitrage opportunity. And so that's what we're doing. Uh, another thing they will try to do is because these are vertically integrated entities, most likely, uh, they will try to say, okay, you have to get your drugs through mail order pharmacy that they control. And so we're undoing that. Uh, it's called steering, and it's a deceptive practice. And so what we're saying is PBMs uh, you know, can't steer you to their vertically integrated mail that if you want to be able to go to your local pharmacy and get it, then you should have a right to be able to do that. If you want to do the mail, that's fine. You should have that option. 
but you should not be forced to do the mail just because they're going to be making more money if you do it that way. Um, so, and then there's also a lot of transparency elements in this, not only for PBMs, but also for prescription drugs and price increases and making sure that they're um, providing the information about why these drugs are going up once they hit a certain threshold. And so we think that that's something that's very, very important. And we're going to be tracking the, the prices of drugs and the increases of drugs. And so uh, according to uh, the most recent research in 2022, uh, drug makers raised prices on more than 1,400 drugs, which is the most they've done since 2015. And so look, I mean, sometimes you develop drugs and, and, and it can be, there could be demand, it can pause it up. That, that does happen. But I think what a lot of those price increases are is just taking advantage of the convoluted system uh, in order to be able uh, to raise prices and make more money on folks. And again, you know, in a, in a good economy, you, know, you make money by providing value to consumers. I mean, that's really where you're supposed to do good. So much of our healthcare system, people are making money, uh, making life more difficult for consumers and making the system less transparent. So we're trying to um, go in a different direction in Florida in a variety of ways, and today is a really big step in that direction. So this is something that when you are dealing with any entrenched interest sacred cow, they don't just let it go. And so these guys in the legislature got lobbied very heavily. They were told the sky's going to fall if you bring transparency to PBMs, even though many other states have actually done it. You know, Florida, we most of the stuff we're usually the first on. This is actually not one we're the first. There's other states that have done it, and it's made a real positive difference. And so we look at that, and we want to go forward. So I want to thank them for their work on this, because I think it's been something that's very, very important in getting this across the finish line. And there was a lot of they were actually saying if you take out the middlemen, it's going to cause the drug prices to skyrocket. I don't know how that could happen uh, because they're, they're making money. But they were saying a lot of stuff, and these guys stood strong. And it ended up passing the, the Florida Senate 40 to nothing, unanimously passed. Because, you know, the people saw this was good. Uh, thanks for uh, working hard with the legislature. We're happy to be able to put this into action. We're going to be, so we've got, the, the legislature actually already put the budget, you know, quote, on the desk. So under Florida Constitution, it sits for, for 72 hours. So they'll vote the budget out on Friday. Uh, we've got a number of bills still in the hopper, but we will be able to do, um, I mean, basically everything we promised we'd do, we did, and then some. And I think you're going to end up, when, when all this is done with the budget, and we go through the budget, and do our, our line item vetoes, and sign the budget, and sign or veto all the bills, I think you'll see since the election in November, because remember, we've done two special sessions since then, uh, I think you'll have seen the most productive uh, six-month stretch uh, that anybody could, could remember, not just in Florida, but show me anywhere around the country that will be able to match this. Uh, and so that's what it's all about. You know, you go, you get opportunity, and you make the most of it, and that's exactly what we're doing. Okay, take some questions. Yes, sir. Yes, Governor. Chris Nelson, Floridian Press. Um, I don't know if you're, you're probably aware of Dr. John Littell. He's a doctor in Florida, 30 plus years. Uh, he had his board certification revoked for COVID-19 misinformation. He was prescribing ivermectin and uh, the board didn't like that. That board's not even in Florida. Now the Protection of Medical Conscience Act passed the house yesterday and would be making it to your desk. Wanted to know if you support that. It will protect doctors like John Littell from uh, that type of retribution. Oh, 100%. And so we called for this last year, actually. And, it, and the, the idea is, so, you know, our, our Florida bail, tough on bail, is anti-New York. Supporting free speech physicians, kind of anti-California. California had a law that said, if you dissent from orthodoxy, if you, like, if you dissent from Fauci, you can get your license revoked. You can get disciplined. And the reality is, it's been the dissenters that have been right about COVID since its inception. And the way you do medicine or any type of science is not to just follow the crowd, but to follow the evidence. And so if you have folks following evidence that conflicts with elite guidance or conflicts with whatever the herd is saying, that is not sufficient uh, reason to get discipline. In fact, we need people to be able uh, to, to uh, uh, support their views. So it's good legislation. We, we thought we had it done last year. It kind of fell off at the very end. 
And so this is one that we said would be a priority of ours, and we are excited that's going to get across the finish line. And I think if you look at our physician free speech and the protections, that'll probably be the strongest in the country. And then we're also doing the medical freedom bill to uh, not just make permanent our protections against COVID authoritarianism, but to expand that uh, for Floridians, for, for other things that they may try to mandate on you. Because COVID was just really uh, uh, the, the means that they used, but they really just wanted to control your behavior. So there's gonna be other things that come down the pike uh, where they'll try to do it. So we're putting those protections in the law. And I think that that's something that's probably gonna be leading the country as well. But I, I want to be a haven for physicians that are willing to put the evidence ahead of whatever some medical society said. And I, just having dealt with COVID, I can tell you a lot of this is very, very political what these medical uh, organizations are doing. I mean, they were coming out saying mask these kids in school. They did not have a basis to do that. That was politics. That was ideology. That was not evidence-based medicine. And so to penalize somebody for following the evidence just because they're conflicting with what whatever the majority view may be is totally inappropriate. And in Florida, I think you're gonna end up seeing us, we're gonna have people that, that wanna practice freely, they're gonna be attracted to the state. So we're gonna end up getting a lot of good physicians. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Danny Travis, CBS 12 News. What would you say was really the defining moment or turning point that you felt you needed to take action against the CDC? Well, I think that the defining moment was the so as a couple things, I mean, one is we've looked for any ways we can to help with prescription drugs. And we fought a lot with this Canadian stuff. We're still fighting. We're disappointed that the Biden administration is holding it up. Uh, we've done the price transparency, which, you know, there, there's been some benefits to that. I think the problem with the price transparency is I can, you can have this portal and you could shop. But if you don't get a benefit as a consumer, if the benefit's just to your insurance company, you really don't have the incentive to do that. So you need the insurers to do shared savings. We didn't mandate shared savings. We do have it with our state employees. So when they choose something cheaper, they actually get rebates and they save in their pocket. So we thought that that was important. Uh, but then we looked at these, this issue of the PBMs and the middlemen. And you had a lot of folks talk about this and point this out. And I'll never forget, I was, um, and so from a price perspective, very important. But then I saw the connection to family owned local businesses and these local pharmacies. I was going through to, to uh, my wife and our kids needed something. So I went through one of the pharmacies and I showed up and the guy's like, you know, he recognized me and he starts saying these PBMs are killing him. And I was like, you know what? We're talking about doing something about that. So hold on. And then sure enough, we were able to do it. So you see it both from a consumer perspective where you literally will charge someone a copay that's higher than the cost of the drug? How is that something that's fair? If there was transparency on that, you would never get away with that. The only reason they get away with it is because it's opaque. So you have that angle, but then you have the situation is, you know, in our country, you know, we need these small businesses and family owned businesses to have a shot. You know, why would you want to stack a pharma industrial complex against the viability of having a local pharmacist that you trust uh, that may be family owned and operated. I don't think we're better off if everything is some faceless big conglomerate that we have to do business with. I think having those be viable is very, very important. So it's really a combination of, of those two things, helping consumers, but also this is, this is really good small business legislation. And it is gonna make a difference for pharmacists uh, throughout the state of Florida, and so so we're proud of that. Governor. Governor, what are your thoughts on legislation to lower the minimum age to purchase a rifle from 21 years old to 18 years old? So I think it's, uh, you know, I said at the time, remember when they raised that, um, you know, I objected to it because I said it was unconstitutional. Look, I was in Iraq. I was there with 18-year-old Marines 18 year old soldiers that were put out in the streets of Fallujah and Ramadi and told they had to risk their lives for this country. Then they come back after doing that. And even though they were carrying a firearm the whole time, they're told you cannot exercise your second amendment rights here as an adult and as a veteran. And so I know it's in the courts um, as well. I do think ultimately uh, it's gonna be determined um, that those blanket prohibitions 
um, are not constitutional. And look, if we're going to say as a society that the age of adulthood is 21, uh, then that would be one thing, but it's not. I mean, you send people out when they're 18, they can vote when they're 18, and so as a constitutionally protected freedom, I don't think that there is basis to say that you can just blanket exclude people arbitrarily uh, on that basis. And um, and I expect the courts ultimately will come down. One more. Oh, thanks for letting me get another one. And he has been taking a lot of shots at you lately using anonymous sources. <laughs> and this kind of offends me as a reporter that there that these guys that are talking crap about you aren't using aren't uh, putting their name on it. Would you just like to uh, comment on that and maybe talk about uh, the, the trip you just took? So it's interesting when, um, and I think the rise of the anonymous sources, what it does, it allows them just to recycle gossip or it allows them to do a pre-cooked narrative that they don't have the goods for. So they can wrap it up in an anonymous source because they couldn't prove it to the reader if they actually had to identify evidence. And so it's a way to create narratives and elevate narrative over fact. But here's the problem. People attack me all the time. I get out of bed, I roll out of bed in the morning, the media's having a spasm, the left's having a spasm. That's fine. Honestly, it just shows you that you're over the target. I mean, if they're, if you have New York media outlets worried about me in Florida, uh, they're not doing that for their health. They, re, they, they understand that what we're doing in Florida, uh, you know, we represent a threat to leftism in this country because we're defeating leftism in the state of Florida. And so they see that, so they want to go. But I think what ends up happening is, the reason why these outlets are not trusted anymore is because people see what they're doing. And so as they embrace these practices more and more, the trust uh, of people has gone down. So they're trying to generate clicks, they're trying to do the narrative, but the problem is most people now just dismiss it. They'll see some headline, oh, anonymous source. We know what these guys are up to. We know what they're doing. And I remember the, uh, one of the guys that used to moderate the presidential debates, uh, Jim Lehrer, he was at PBS, and he had these rules for journalism. And one of the rules he said is, you do not use anonymous sources except in like really extreme situations. So for example, I mean, if there was like real serious malfeasance in government and someone you know, provided information and they wanted their identity, you know, maybe you can say to expose that for the good of the public, you do but you do not launder anonymous sources to smear somebody. If somebody's gonna go after you, you should, as a journalist, you should demand they put their name to that. And if they're not willing to put their name to the accusation, then you would never run with it, ever, if you cared about actual standards. But I think those standards have been chucked aside. I think some of it's a, it's, it's a race for clicks, but some of it is just, you know, you've seen a lot of the, the legacy outlets transform from yeah, they always had a liberal bias, but now real active partisans in terms of trying to pursue an agenda. And those are choices that people can make, but I think the, the upshot of the choice is nobody trusts these people anymore. Everybody knows when they see this stuff, they know someone's trying to feed them uh, some type of narrative. They're trying to sell you a bill of goods. And so in that sense, it's like as much as they try to recycle all this and try to, try to smear me, I know that most people look at it and they just reject it, and that's not something that they're uh, that they're putting much weight into. So hopefully, you know, I, I just think facts matter. I think the truth matters, and I don't think we can govern our society based on manufactured narratives. Uh, and I think that that we've got to be grounded in truth. All right, thank you all for coming. So good to see everybody. Take care.